engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. What that essentially means is discovery, advances, advances questions, research, technology. Unbelievable. Without further ado, this is The Naked Scientist. Hello and welcome to The Naked Scientist, the show where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine. I'm Julia Ravy and in this week's programme, a mysterious outbreak of hepatitis cases among British children, the robot capable of jumping over a house that might help us to hop on the moon and video calls causing a crash in creativity. And in the second part of the programme, we will be popping up to talk about ads. They know everything about you. Do you want people to know, insurance companies, you may have a certain health condition and that you're really worried about it and you've begun taking medication? Do you want pharmaceuticals to know? We are thought to be exposed to thousands of ads every single day. But how do these marketing employees actually get us to buy? We explore how these campaigns play on our psychology to hook us in and how advertisers use programmatic techniques to place incredibly specific temptations on our device screens. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. In recent months, over 100 young children under five across the UK have been admitted to hospital with signs of liver damage. This is called hepatitis. Thankfully, most have recovered, but some have been life-threatening. So far, investigators have drawn a blank regarding the cause, although there is speculation that a new infection could be responsible or it might be a knock-on effect of some of the public health measures used to control COVID-19. Will Irving is a clinical virologist at the University of Nottingham. Chris Smith asked him how this came to light in the first place. It was first picked up in Scotland where public health authorities noticed that they were receiving an increased number of reports of young children with severe liver damage. And then uh, the UK Health Security Agency put out an alert and a number of other cases were identified right across the UK. I think at the moment we're around about 110 cases. And following the UK raising an alert with the World Health Organization, cases have been reported in quite a few countries in Europe, America and in Japan. And this all started when? The first alarm was raised about three weeks ago, but the cases that we're counting are from the 1st of January this year. And to see 110 cases of young children with jaundice in a period of four months is extraordinary. It's a really unusual event. To add to the problem is that we don't know what the cause is. So how are they investigating it then? All of these children will have a, a number of investigations. They're usually ill enough to be in hospital, so samples are taken. There are a standard set of viruses which are known to cause hepatitis, but the tests for all of those viruses in all of these children have been negative. An alternative possibility is that there is some kind of toxin these children are being exposed to, so that is being investigated. But at the moment, none of the usual suspects have turned out to be the cause. Surprising if it's a toxin that if that were the case, that it would be so broad geographically and also just focused on that young age group, because you're saying they're all young kids. Yes. My first thoughts when I first heard of it was that maybe there were individual families who were perhaps ordering some kind of nutritional supplement online, which was contaminated with something. It's still on the table. I think at the moment we have to maintain an open mind as to precisely what the cause is. Have those investigating ruled out COVID as a possibility? Because that seems to be responsible for and capable of causing pretty much everything, as far as I can tell, over the last two years. Well, in terms of a direct link, of those 100-odd children in the UK, a small percentage at the time that they presented with their severe illness were infected with SARS coronavirus 2. But it's less than a fifth. It doesn't appear that an immediate COVID infection is resulting in the hepatitis. That is not to say that the pandemic and SARS-CoV-2, the virus, are not in some way related to this outbreak. It would be quite a coincidence, I think, 
to imagine that this outbreak happened just at the end of a two years worth of pandemic that has nothing to do with it. So what do you think that relationship could be then? It's possible that these children have been infected with SARS-CoV-2 before they became ill and that that in some way has altered the ability of their immune response to deal with the normal childhood virus infections they would usually be exposed to. And then you have the huge behavioural change across the entire population we've undergone because of the COVID pandemic. So we've been isolating. And there's no doubt that over the last two years, the circulation of viruses, which are normally very common in the community, has been reduced. Last August in the UK, we removed most of the precautions that that society was taking, which means that during the last winter, these children who mostly are between three years and six years old have, if you like, come out into the community having had two years worth of isolation and that maybe in some way they've been exposed this winter to a whole range of different viruses and that may have caused their immune system to react in some peculiar way which has resulted in liver damage. Presumably we've got samples from these children or at least a proportion of them and those will be being tested so are there any things coming up in those tests that might point towards what viral causes there are? There is one lead um, that many of these children have been shown to be infected with an adenovirus. Adenoviruses are very common childhood infections. There are many different types of adenovirus, but about three quarters of the children where it's been looked for have been found to be positive for an adenovirus. Now, that's interesting, and clearly uh, we can't ignore that. But it has to be said that adenoviruses in otherwise healthy children are not known as a cause of hepatitis. We know viruses mutate over time and that can sometimes alter their behavior. So there are laboratories that are busy looking at the genetic sequence of these adenoviruses to see if there's anything peculiar. But at the moment, we don't know which is the correct explanation. And are the kids okay? I mean, are they recovering? Yes, most of the children are spending some time in hospital being supported and then their liver is recovering. The liver has a very great capacity to recover and then they're going home. There have been around about 10 children where the liver damage has been so great that they've needed a liver transplant. I'm not sure about within the UK, but I think there have been uh, one or two deaths reported from other countries. So it is potentially serious, but 90% of these children are recovering and going home. Will Irving there. A record-breaking robot that can jump over a house and generate G-forces 30 times greater than a fighter pilot would feel is the brainchild of engineer Elliot Hawks. As scientists are turning their attention back to the moon with trips they're planned for the near future, machines capable of this sort of giant leap could become very attractive as a way of getting about. Harry Lewis heard how nature was the inspiration for this new robot. In animals, you're you're limited by basically the work your muscle can do in a single stroke. So if you imagine, you know, you're you're lifting a weight with your arm or something, the, the energy you can produce is basically the one contraction of your bicep. And that's it. And if you're a flea, you know, fleas jump by storing energy in a spring and then rapidly releasing it. So really the upper bound of their jump height is set by the energy they can produce in one stroke. The best jumper out there is is this Galago. A bush baby is another name for it. I think it's a little marsupial. It's got long legs, long tail. Its real secret is that it has more muscle, jumping muscle per body mass than really any other creature. How on earth, Elliot, does the bush baby link to robotics in robotics we, we have this thing it's called you know bio-inspired design biomimicry where we often look at animals and say oh okay well this is how animals have evolved to do it it's probably a pretty good solution for our problem maybe we should build something kind of like that what we found here though is that there's some pretty fundamental differences between a jumping animal and a jumping robot so they don't have to use a motor 
uh, that's like a muscle in that you only get this one contraction. And what this means is you're not limited to that single stroke like the muscle of the animal is. You can basically produce as much energy as you want and store it into a spring for a single jump. So your limit is no longer your muscle for an engineered jumper. It's really the spring. You've applied this knowledge to an actual prototype. Yeah, exactly. So in animals, the spring is a very small percent of their body mass. And that's because it should all be muscle. Like you want to maximize your muscle. You don't need much spring because you just can't store that much energy. So you don't need much spring. We can store tons of energy for a robot. So basically what we did is we made the motor as small as possible because it can just keep winding for a long time. If you have plenty of time between jumps, again, if you're constrained in your time between jumps, then, then you need a bigger motor. But we were saying, how high can you jump with all the time in the world? So we put on a tiny, tiny motor and then made, basically made the robot all spring. And so relative to body mass, it has about a hundred times more spring mass than an animal. Kind of the key to performance is how much energy you can store in that spring per unit mass of the spring. And so that was kind of a lot of the work went into how can we optimize this spring. And uh, what was the result? How, how high can your robot jump? Yeah, the, the animal jumps 2.25 meters and uh, ours jumps 32.9 meters. <laughs> yeah. I should mention the thing is only... 30 centimeters tall, it takes off at 30 meters per second. And so it goes from zero meters per second when it's crouched and ready to jump to 30 meters per second. And it does that in nine milliseconds. If you start doing some of the calculations there, you can think about the acceleration that this little thing is going through. And it's something like 315 G. Oh my, I, can we compare that to something? Yeah, let's see. Um, like a fighter pilot experiences maybe 8G, and that's about the limits of what a human can can uh, withstand before they pass out. I take it this is the most impressive jump made by a robot to date, is it? I mean, you never know, but we, we believe it is the highest jump ever by anything in the history of the world, <laughs> which is kind of a fun thing to think about. That's awesome. Um, that's so good. Okay, so t- take the fun out of it, and let me ask the million dollar uh, university funding question. <laughs> Why? We've been working with NASA on this project and turns out the moon is an incredibly benign place to jump <laughs> because gravity is about one sixth what it is on earth and it has almost no atmosphere. So it turns out on the moon, you could jump something like 125 meters high while jumping forward uh, half of a kilometer in a single jump. One of the um, applications that we've discussed with NASA is actually jumping down into craters. Um, So these are, you know, they have steep sides and they're rocky and the jumper could just hop down into there, collect potentially a little sample and hop back out. Might still be a few years away from a robotic pole vault. Elliot Hawks there, he's at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he published that robotic leap forward in the journal Nature. We all know how good it feels to get a decent night's sleep. And now new research published in Nature Aging this week thinks it's found the sweet spot for the optimal number of hours individuals in their mid to late life should be getting. Crystal Langley, one of the authors on this paper from the University of Cambridge, joins us now. So, Crystal, what was the conclusion on the optimal number of hours of sleep based on your study? So our study showed that seven hours of sleep was the optimal duration in a large cohort of middle to later aged individuals for cognition, mental health and well-being. But it's not only the duration of sleep that is important, but also the consistency of optimal sleep. So fluctuations in sleep duration over time was also associated with poorer cognitive and mental health outcomes. And we identified some of the key brain regions also associated with sleep duration. And these included the hippocampus, which is well known for its role in learning and memory, and also areas of the frontal cortex, which are involved in the top-down control of emotion. Wow, so sleep is very important. I mean, I always think, how do you study sleep? Because you can't very well be standing over lots of people and watching them and monitoring them as they sleep. So what methods did you employ to come to these conclusions? This particular study was a collaboration between researchers at the University of Cambridge and Fudan University, and we used existing data from the UK Biobank, which is a large scale database of approximately 500,000 individuals. So this database includes questionnaire measures of sleep duration, measures of cognition, including things like processing speed, memory and executive function. And it also includes questionnaires of mental health symptoms, including depression and anxiety. We examined whether sleep duration was associated with any of these measures. 
Um, and we specifically use something called nonlinear models to investigate these associations. And essentially, this allowed us to determine the optimal duration of sleep where either more or less would have a negative impact on cognition and mental health. On average, individuals who get less than seven hours sleep a night, what relationships did you see there with these people? So as I mentioned, we did use these nonlinear models, which allowed us to specifically test how many hours sleep cognition and mental health were best. So we showed that both too little and too much sleep was associated with poorer cognitive performance. The relationship may suggest that non-optimal sleep may be a risk factor for cognitive decline in aging. And this is supported by reports where insufficient or excessive sleep was associated with an increased risk of developing dementia. We can't say for sure why too little sleep has a negative impact on cognition, but it's possible that it may be due to the disruption of slow wave sleep, which has been shown to be important for memory consolidation. And reduced sleep may also have a negative consequence on the clearance of toxins. And this is also a really important component of sleep. And very briefly, I mean, for some individuals, it may be the case that they just can't get to sleep. And it's quite frustrating sometimes to hear you must get seven hours. So based on your results, have you got one tip for someone who is struggling to sleep? Some of the recent technology suggests that using apps or sleeping diaries to monitor sleeping behaviour is a really good idea. Well, I will definitely try that. That was Crystal Langley from the University of Cambridge, summarising research published this week in Nature Ageing. From baffling British weather, the sideways spines of the vertebrae coming off here, to looking at a cheetah from the inside out, games making their way to the clinic, and what to eat in your garden. Mm. The Naked Scientists In Short podcasts bring you a top up of short, compelling science stories. Listen and download for free at nakedscientist.com slash short or subscribe to Naked Specials wherever you get your podcasts. Still to come, how advertisers know what you're thinking better than you do yourself and why video call meetings may hold our creative sides back. Now, as the parents of Harry Enfield's character Kevin knew only too well, when you talk to a teenager, sometimes it can feel like your words are going in one ear and out the other. And as a teenager yourself, you may have felt like interacting with someone else was infinitely cooler than listening to your parents. A study published this week in the Journal of Neuroscience suggests that this selective tuning out may actually be biological. I heard how from Stanford's Dan Abrams. So we brought in a cohort of 13 to 16 year olds. We brought in their moms and we recorded their moms saying these very brief nonsense words. T but I shalt. And then we had their brain activity measured using fMRI when they heard both their mother's voice Key but I shalt. and unfamiliar female voices saying the exact same thing that their mother said. Key but I shalt. And in contrast to what we saw with the younger kids, in adolescence, we saw the exact opposite response, which is a greater reward response in response to unfamiliar voices compared to mother's voice. So we saw this kind of switch. Was that what you expected to see compared to the younger children? I wish I could say that I saw this coming. (laughs) Sometimes science kind of works like this, where you kind of stumble onto a really cool result. We think it's evolutionarily adaptive. We think that kids, at some point, they need to build their own life, build their own social network, and make their own social world. And we think that the biological process needs to occur by which kids are required to leave their, their family and their, their kind of immediate caregivers. After learning about Dan's work, I had to get a first-hand assessment of my own teenage ears from none other than my mum, Shell. When I was a teenager, did I ignore you? Honestly, I can't think of a time that you did ignore me, to be honest. Maybe at the age of three, you started to want to go your own way. You were more interested in other people then, really. We used to have a pram and you used to face me and you used to have your head on a swivel to see everyone going past. But I wouldn't say you actually ignored us. I think you were a very good teenager, to be honest. Or did you feel like what you were saying, like I wasn't listening to you? I, I feel more of that now, really. <laughs>
<laughs> you, you're in Planet Julia, aren't you? Well, yeah, this is this is very true. But I'm glad I was going to say I was going to apologise if you felt like that. But then I was going to say it's biology, so I apologise for biology. Oh, don't be blaming biology. Wasn't that a song by, what was it, Little Mix? Girls Aloud. Oh, Girls Aloud. While we debate naughties pop groups, it seems I've always ignored my parents. But for those living with teens now and are struggling with this, and for teenagers themselves who are maybe being told off for not taking in every word their parents say, I asked Dan if he had any tips based on his findings of how to handle this communication mismatch. I think an important message is that it's easy to kind of maybe malign adolescents for maybe not listening to their parents or for tuning out their parents. And I think as adults, we can all look back on that and say, well, I wasn't entirely trying to block my parents out. I was just kind of living my life and focusing on my friends. Adolescents tune into these new social partners, but it's not personal. This is just where their mind is going. And this is just what their their brain is doing. Maybe for parents to know that this is a, a natural part of adolescent development. When we think about our own behavior and what dictates what we do when we think about listening to someone we think about the words and the instruction not necessarily the voice itself I think it's really interesting that your study has shown it's not the words or the instruction or even the emotion it's just who's speaking yeah you know I think it's easy to take voices for granted they're everywhere we argue that voices are among the most pleasurable stimuli that we have in our everyday lives it helps people feel connected and part of a group and part of a family, it speaks to how important it is to, to hear each other and to connect with each other in, in kind of natural ways that are, you know, without our devices and without texting and all the like. So blame biology instead of the teenager and talking of voices. How much more scouts do I go when I talk to my mum? Chat to Dan Abrams there. That work was published in the Journal of Neuroscience. Hold on. I just need to let the dog out and start the washing machine. Believe it or not, a civil servant manning a government helpline said that to someone they were helping recently as a reason for needing to interrupt a telephone call. While working from home has had its benefits, some businesses are beginning to question the hidden costs, including lost productivity and potentially creativity. And a new study published in Nature seems to be singing from the same song sheet. Columbia University's Melanie Brooks compared how well people came up with work-related ideas at either in-person meetings or virtual ones. She told James Titko what she found, and he was eager to hear first how she could assign a value to the creative output of the people they studied. We independently assess these ideas by giving the ideas to outside judges who weren't part of the study. And we ask them to rate each idea on novelty. And the other metric is value or appropriateness. And so we can assign a numerical value to each of these ideas. And this is obviously very topical research because people have been using video calling for work since the pandemic here. And it looks like it's here to stay, at least in part, as we move into life after the virus. It's also a bit extra topical at the minute here in the UK after... Jacob Rees-Mogg, who's a senior government minister, started visiting the offices of his civil servants unannounced in a bid to encourage staff to start working in the office more frequently. Does your research suggest he's got a point? There's a lot of things to consider here. So what we're finding is a cognitive cost to interacting virtually. So people generate fewer ideas and fewer creative ideas when they're engaging in video interaction compared to when they're in the same physical space. So I think it's valuable to be in person. That being said, there's lots of value to virtual work. And I would not say that this work suggests that we need to always be in person and there's no reason to do remote work as well. So it's not unequivocally worse to be working virtually, but did your research lead you to theorize as to why you got the results you did and why that creative spark comes from being in the same physical space as others. We realize that there's a really big difference in shared environment. Actually, the physicality of how we're interacting. In virtual interaction, the only shared environment you really have is the screen. And this is particularly true now that people blur out their backgrounds. We thought that this shared environment might compel people to look more at the screen, almost be tethered to that screen, because anytime you look away, 
you're disengaging from the interaction. And so that's what we find. We actually extracted eye gaze and we were able to look at where they were looking. Are they looking at their partner? Are they looking at the surrounding room? People look at their partner almost twice as much when they're interacting virtually. And this explains the negative effect on idea generation because when you're more visually focused, you're more cognitively focused. When you're tethered to the screen and you're filtering out all of your environment, that actually affects your ability to cognitively wander as well. We're conducting this call over Zoom. What are the implications, I suppose, from your study for radio shows like ours? So first I'll say this is also the value of having Mm. virtual communication, that you can speak to people all across the country. And that's not something that we should just drop just because there might be some negative consequences to interacting virtually. But what my recommendation would be if you need to interact on a video call is to do actually exactly what we're doing right now, which is to turn the video off because that untethers you to that screen. And now you're able to visually wander your environment again. And that's going to lead to to more cognitive wandering as well. Well, luckily, I've got a perfect face for radio, so the camera stays firmly off in this show. That was Melanie Brooks speaking with James Titko. Sandwich biscuits are a tasty sweet treat that we often like to indulge in at the Naked Scientist office, and it seems everyone has their own way of eating them. Recently, a team at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have created a device called the Oreo meter that can perfectly remove the top layer from an Oreo biscuit for those of that persuasion. And since this just so happens to be our own Otis Kingsman's preferred method for eating an Oreo, we had him speak to the team who made it. How do you like your sandwich biscuits? For me, I like to try and snap off the top to get to that individual crunchy layer. But when I do, the biscuit always crumbles. Fortunately, Crystal Owens and Gareth McKinley from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have invented a device which can do the job perfectly. What we found in the lab is that a a twisting motion is the best for getting a very clean break of the cream from a wafer. We actually designed a little oreometer, which is a 3D printed device that you can stick a cookie in. It will provide this twisting motion to an Oreo that's held very carefully by rubber bands. So in order to get the top off, twisting is the best motion, as it's all based in the science of rheology. Rheology is the study of the flow of matter. And one of the things that rheologists are very careful to do is to define how they twist or or pull on things. And you need to make sure that you either make things slide or make things stretch in a certain way. A standard test that we always use is called a shearing test. The goal is to generate a sliding motion of your Oreo biscuit against your Oreo cream. And what you find is that the weakest part is actually at the interface between the cream, the white cream, and the dark biscuit. It works by the cream filling being similar to both a solid and liquid state of matter, or as they put it, mushy. Many of our materials are what we would call viscoelastic, and that means that they have some viscous properties and some elastic or solid-like properties. And the cream in particular is an example of a material that looks solid and is solid if you don't push on it very hard. But when you push on it harder, it will actually flow like a liquid. So we say that these materials have a yield stress. What does that mean? It means they're solid below that stress, but when you push on them hard enough, they will flow like a liquid. And the combination is that we would describe this material as indeed mushy. From their analysis of the Oreo cream, they were able to design the machine around its properties to remove the top layer perfectly. The Oreo cream is much stronger than it is sticky, so it tends to just come off from one wafer. And so if you have the perfect twisting motion on a freshly opened pack of Oreos, you will get one wafer that is just bare with maybe like a little tiny bit of cream and then one wafer that has all the cream. These results may seem pretty insignificant at first, but there are actually a few wider applications for it. People like things that uh, don't taste too gritty or don't taste too sticky or don't taste too slimy. Rheology is the science that really allows us to put some numbers to those things and allows us to control for them. And that's really important, particularly as people start to formulate low fat foods or artificial meats. Getting that texture and getting the properties right is an extremely important part of the consumer experience. 
even though we published a full study, we haven't even begun to answer all of the questions someone could ask about Oreos. We have freely distributed the design files for someone to make their own Oreometer to do other tests, maybe with Oreos at different uh, temperatures or with different brands of sandwich cookies. That's right. Those with a 3D printer can achieve this level of superiority and aid in the development of Oreology. I, however, am going to stick to my hands-on method. The way the cookie crumbles, eh? Crystal Owens and Gareth McKinley, they were speaking with Otis Kingsman and they published that work in the journal Physics of Fluids. Much has changed for business owners, managers and staff recently. But with over 30 years' experience in telecommunications, award-winning independent company Spitfire have the expertise to make sure you stay ahead and can keep on innovating. Whether it's connectivity, MPLS networks, firewalls, or phone systems, Spitfire can help. To find out more, go to spitfire.co.uk. That's spitfire.co.uk. Spitfire, telecoms and IP engineering solutions for business since 1988. Music in the program is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for audio and video productions. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Julia Ravey. And for the second part of the show, I am joined by none other than my fellow Naked Scientist, James Titko. Hi, Julia. Hello. So I was wondering, what was the last thing you bought based on an advert? Oh, I bought a new dress on the internet. I probably, and my wardrobe probably, didn't need that, to be honest. And do you have any idea why you may have made that purchase? I don't know, actually. I'd seen the ad a few times. It popped up a few times, so maybe something to do with exposure? Well, this was the exact thought I was having while I was watching TV. I can block out most ads from registering, but there are those few that have the power to tear me away from scrolling my social media, which, it also occurs to me, is full of yet more ads. (laughs) This sent me down a rabbit hole, which I'm still trying to set straight in my own head. Like everyone, I'm frustrated by ads. They're not just on TV anymore, of course. They're on social media, news websites, everywhere. At the same time, I'm also fascinated by them. The fact that they are everywhere, and increasingly so, suggests to me that their effectiveness at this point is unquestionable. During the most recent World Cup, ITV were charging somewhere between four to five hundred thousand pounds for 30 second ads during England's semi final against Croatia. Who could be spending this much money without a guarantee of some sort of return on that investment? I also know that the ads I do see, well, they're often bonkers. What does a talking meerkat from Russia have to do with making me more likely to use a certain price comparison website? With all this in mind, I wanted to find out what I could about advertising from a scientific standpoint. Why they are the way they are, how we are being influenced by them, and who or what dictates which ads we see. My first port of call was Leslie Hallam, who runs the psychology and marketing course at the University of Lancaster. For all of us, we have a kind of orienting response, which is more or less alerted when we are looking at ads. In some cases, we pay attention and we realise it's not anything to do with us. Sometimes we pay attention, continue to pay attention, despite the fact that it's not to do with us, if we're not in the target market at all for the product. Other times, it's just a really striking ad and it kind of gets your attention and keeps you there. It's a kind of very basic hard wiring uh, that's being played to create a form of memory, a uh, kind of trace in our long-term memory store, which is the kind of goal of any advertising, really. But if you're not aware of it, you can't pay attention. If you're not paying attention, you don't remember it. If you don't remember it, you simply have no change in your propensity to purchase when you come across that product. I think where perhaps it, it departs a little bit from the narrow path that is in kind of peer-reviewed in journals and you know, sensible psychology is when it comes to things like emotionality and the impact it has on decision-making and how we measure emotionality in advertising is quite a controversial area. You've touched nicely there, I suppose, on the tricky territory we're in, how we can use science to explain emotion. I guess I'm looking for your advice, really, as to whether I'm wasting my time trying to look for scientific explanations to the questions I have about modern advertising and how emotion and creativity get us to buy things. I don't think there's any doubt uh, in in anybody's mind that having an emotional response to an ad is a a very powerful 
uh, method of engaging people with your brand, with your product. And if you create a positive emotion, then that emotion is recreated when you see the brand again in the supermarket or the car showroom or wherever, kind of Pavlovian response at one level. And that energy, that emotionality becomes part of the, the thing we associate then with the brand or the product. You simply experience the emotion. You don't really go into it and think, yeah, do I really believe that you know, there is, is this warm feeling associated with it? Because really what they're trying to do in advertising all the time is reach into your subconscious rather than your consciousness. Um, and subconscious is a very fuzzy area within psychology, within science, I know. So it's, I, I'm kind of low to use it, but it's such a powerful element within what, what advertisers try to do here. So I'm not suggesting, you know, anything to do with dreams or kind of weird, spooky stuff or collective unconscious. I mean, I'm not saying they're not there, but they're not scientific. Um, they're a different way of looking at the world. But clearly scientists use a, the concept of subconscious as well. And subconscious in this sense is the kind of preconceptual realm. And it's very emotional. It's very appetitive. It's desirous. It's very uncritical response and a bit unconstrained. Advertisers try to, to reach into that. Uh, so overall, the emotions prefigure our decision-making, and that's why it's such a powerful arena for advertisers to try and access. Leslie Hallam from the University of Lancaster there. I'm not sure how keen I am at the idea of advertisers trying to infiltrate my subconscious. I know what you mean. So how advertisers access the subconscious part of our brains is largely to do with making us respond emotionally. And there are businesses out there that can put metrics to these mannerisms. One of these ad testing agencies is UK-based Kantar. Their clients come to them looking for help at all stages of the development of their marketing campaigns. And they're trying to use methods based on science to assess how well an ad may perform. Vera Sidlova, Kantar's creative director, explained a few of the tools in their arsenal. So we use a tool called Link, which is a survey-based tool. We have a set of questions that measure the strength of association between the ad and the brands. We measure how much you enjoy watching the ad, whether it stood out of the crowd, whether it would really capture attention. We also capture how it changes your opinion and predisposition towards the brand. But in addition to asking survey questions, we also use a neuroscientific method called facial coding, which is a software that we use using your webcams. We ask you if you agree to be facial coded. And if you say yes, then using your webcam, we monitor your face while you're watching the ad. And we're not actually watching your visit video physically. The machine just records the movement of the smallest muscles on your face to decode whether you're frowning or smiling or maybe experiencing a little bit of disgust or confusion or maybe a bit of a smirk. And it does that analysis second by second as you watch the ad. So it is a combination of that neuroscientific method and your answers to survey questions that we use to determine quantitatively how an ad is doing. How do your clients usually act on your analysis? I presume they come to you looking for data-driven reassurance, basically, that their campaigns are going to be successful. How do you convince them or reassure them that what they're going to put out there will be received well? We have metrics that are validated to sales. So our clients know that if an ad scores high in Link, it is going to deliver on ROI. How, now, do, you, how do you convince them of that? Well, we've, we've done studies to show that ads yeah. that have scored high on link then had higher responses in sales. So we've got some big metadata to show and to prove that. But in terms of a single ad we'd be looking at, so we have the strength of the database, we've got the validation work, but then usually what we do is we look at the data together and we're trying to figure out the why behind that data. So for example, we could have an ad that we see isn't resonating with people as much as the client had hoped. It's not doing terribly, but it's not doing great either. And so the conversation would be, what can we do between now and airing to make the ad more enjoyable? And if the ad was, for example, supposed to be enjoyable because of a funny joke, we would study using facial coding, whether the joke was actually being received, whether all groups found it funny, whether there's a comprehension problem. Does it tell you things different from what you can get from the survey? Is it offering alternative data? 
Yeah, so our faces often show things that we ourselves aren't conscious of. And so what the survey gives you is what the respondent themselves remembers and is also willing to disclose in a survey. But what the face tells you is a very second by second view of how they felt at a particular second of watching the ad. And those might be things they aren't even conscious of themselves. Vera sent me a demo of the software they use at Kantar to record the micro expressions which help them analyze ads. I wanted someone who knew next to nothing about what the software was looking for to run the test. And I also knew I wanted someone who I thought might produce some fairly emotive responses to get some detailed results. This left just one candidate. James has sent me a link to an ad testing service. I've been presented with the Coca-Cola Christmas advert, an advert for Plenty, which is kitchen roll. Oh, my camera's just come on, loading the emotion detector. Welcome, we are about to play a video for you. The graph below will plot your engagement with the video over time using various metrics. Coca-Cola Christmas. Oh, so cute. Oh my God, I'm crying. I hadn't seen that advert before. Oh no. So it was a dad who was trekking across to get give Santa a note from his daughter. The letter just says, Santa, I want my daddy home for Christmas. Oh God, I'm crying. Well, that emotion off the chart and my valence, which I'm guessing is my engagement. I was really engaged with that advert. So that to me was a very emotional one. Okay, next video. I can't imagine I'm going to be emotionally engaged with Kitchen Roll, but you never know. Ooh. Are you joking me? <laughs> that one was really funny. It was essentially a Christmas day and everything was going wrong. There was a cat that pooped on the floor. There was a baby who was sick all over someone. And in every instance where there was a mess, the kitchen roll was there to like clean it all up. Yeah, my disgust was pretty high, but I was extremely expressive. Like my expressiveness was on the ceiling throughout all of it. Cause I think I was laughing. Right, well, I'll pass back over to James now to learn a bit more. Well, if I'm honest, that went pretty much as expected. Julia's emotional engagement broke the scale with those two ads. But it's not just obvious expressions which the software can detect. So they could have frowned a little bit when a certain element appeared, or they could have showed disgust maybe when there was a food shot. And there are a lot of things that happen in the course of an even 30 second ad that your brain would never be able to recall because you wouldn't be conscious of even making that small uh, muscle movement on your face. Kind of want to pick your brain a bit and ask your opinion on what you see as the role of of science in this industry and in, in what you do. I personally see the role of science as helping us understand consumers and the people who are consuming our advertising, because I think advertising is part art and part science, right? We've got the great creativity that agencies bring, but how it's going to land and what effect it's going to have is something we may not no, initially. And that is why research is important, both at the individual like advertising piece level, but also broader. How are people perceiving advertising? How does their brain work when they watch content in general? What makes them smile? What makes them laugh? What are they sensitive to? And so I really think there is a big role for science to play in this and to really help all of us understand just what makes us tick. Because I think it's no secret that none of us watch TV to watch advertising. I mean, we don't go on, on our phones to watch a digital banner. It has to do its work. It has to capture our attention. It has to tell us something that's meaningful to us. And the how of that, how we do that, is quite a mystery. And research can help unveil that. Vera Sidlova from Kantar there. And James. Put me on an emotional roller coaster with zero warning. I was not prepared for that. Well, I wanted a big emotional response and I certainly got one. Redefining what we mean <laughs> by micro expressions ever so slightly there. So that was a bit of an emotional episode for me. But James, do you have any idea why those two ads got to me so much? 
Orlando Wood, Chief Innovation Officer of Market Research Company System One and Honorary Fellow of the Institute of Practicing Advertisers, might be the person to answer that question. There are such a range of ads out there, from cinematic spectacles to annoying pop-ups. I started by asking him what separates the best advertising from the rest. The advertising we're talking about has to do a few things. It has to capture people's attention, it has to be interesting and entertaining, and it has to lodge things in your memory so that that brand it comes to mind first before any other that sort of brand building advertising has to capture our what i describe as broad beam attention and that means usually advertising that involves the living it involves characters perhaps the use of music the use of humor all of these things are of interest to as some psychologists would describe it the right hemisphere of the brain the half of the brain that presents the world to us i'm really interested on the way you characterize the right brain there can you go a bit deeper on that maybe and especially how it's distinguished from perhaps the left hemisphere of the brain all my work here rests on the brilliant research of a philosopher psychiatrist neuroscientist called ian the gilchrist who talks about the two hemispheres of the brain and describes them not in terms of that they do different things, but more that they do things differently. They have different takes on the world. The right brain, he describes it, presents the world to us with this kind of broad and vigilant attention. For the left hemisphere then to look at more closely, bring a narrow beam attention to look at the detail, to manipulate what we see, to control it, to to make use of it, if you like. According to Ian the Gilchrist, The right hemisphere is open to contradiction, open to novelty. It can see that two opposing thoughts could be true at the same time, which means it understands metaphor, it understands humour, and it understands and appreciates music in a way that the left hemisphere feels is very difficult. It can't can't really do that so well. It has other ways of looking at things. It likes to categorise, break things down into smaller parts. What I describe in my work, looking at advertising styles and how they've changed actually in the last 15, 20 years, is that in culture, I believe, things have moved to a very left brain dominant view, more literal, more transactional, more rigid, really. And advertising has become very mechanistic. So you see words on the screen, very rhythmic soundtracks. So you don't see live time, you don't see dialogue, you don't hear music so much. You don't see characters like you used to. Jingles disappeared a long time ago. And it's to do with these habits of thinking, I believe, and how culture has shifted towards a more left brain dominant view. Can you tell me a bit about what advertising was before whatever inciting incident it might have been? It all started in the late 50s and early 60s with people like Bill Burnback, DDB in New York, Bill Birnbach, pioneer of the creative revolution in advertising in the 1950s and 60s, famously said, advertising is fundamentally persuasion, and persuasion happens to be not a science, but an art. Before Birnbach, advertising was formulaic. It wasn't particularly eye-catching, it wasn't provocative, it was safe. That all changed thanks to Bill Birnbach and DDB. Listeners might remember some of the VW ads, the Think Small campaign. And of course, in the States where everything was about thinking big, they dared to say Think Small and they put a little beetle up in the top left-hand corner. Through the unification of concept, colour and language, DDB were able to turn the VW beetle, a small, ugly and to its particular detriment in post-war America, German car, into a cultural icon. Its size and the way it looked became part of its appeal, its attractiveness. This was reflected in the advertisements in magazines. The small image of the beetle in black and white is dwarfed by the blankness of the rest of the page it occupies. Teenagers were ripping the ad out of the publications it was printed in and pinning it up on their bedroom walls. Because Bill Birnbach, he believed in, I suppose, in a kind of humanity over pomposity. He believed that things should be done differently, that nobody's perfect and nobody's going to believe you if you claim to be. Which I think set the tone and tone of voice for many campaigns in the following years. And it worked very well. And how do we get back to that that style of advertising, that boldness? I work for a company called System One that 
tests advertising, an emotional response to advertising, and gives advertisers a, a sense of how successful it's going to be because emotion orientates our attention, puts things into long term memory and helps to create the kind of advertising that people actually enjoy watching rather than this mechanistic, rather brutal stuff which people tend to want to avoid. We test emotional response to advertising. We help people to create better work. We help. And that is one way in which we can get back to great work, of course, in the way that we measure it. There is a, a kind of advertising which has become particularly widespread, I'd say, in the last 15 years or so with our ability to target people. And that's today known as performance or activation advertising, sometimes called response advertising. And that really seeks to nudge people towards a, a particular brand that people might be interested in in the buying moment. So, you know, I may well be in the market for a sofa right now and get an ad which is very product centric and which may lead me towards that website or downloading that app or whatever else. And that's a different style of advertising, actually, and that the work I've done in this area suggests that the two different types work quite differently and that the kinds of effects that advertisers are likely to see are going to be quite different too. Orlando Wood from System One. That second type of advertising, the short, snappy ones, make up most of the ads that I get exposed to on my social media pages. But what I'm keen to get to the bottom of is how do these sites pick which ads to show me? Because it almost seems to be tailored. I'm not surprised you're seeing a lot of ads on social media because digital ads are set to exceed 60% of global ad spend in 2022. Our habits and behaviours are shifting away from our TVs and towards devices constantly connected to the internet, creating opportunities for companies to use our data to personalise ads in ways never seen before. This is called programmatic advertising, and I spoke with Jeff Chester from the Centre for Digital Democracy in Washington, D.C., to find out how this form of advertising works and what it means for our future relationships with the companies trying to sell us things. What people in the advertising business realised around 2009, 2010, that the same super fast computers used to buy and sell shares of stocks on stock exchanges that were able to make decisions in milliseconds and compile huge amounts of data could also be deployed to buy and sell people to deliver targeted ads and that the online environment was the perfect place to allow this very powerful set of technologies could be used and deliver the exact ad to the person based on all the information an advertiser had access to. Initially, everybody was basically put out for auction. Advertisers would bid to place an ad in front of, uh, of you, James, because you fit the right demographic. So they knew that you had bought the product previously or you were a suitable target. Over time, it's evolved. So in addition to buying and selling people, which is really what programmatic advertising is about, the data-driven process based on your profile, based on all the analysis that they're able to do in real time. And what's key here is that this system of data surveillance follows you from site to site, application to application, and device to device. And it's able increasingly now to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to make far ranging predictions about how you will behave. So for example, if you're not responding to the ad for the breakfast cereal in the right way that they hope that you will do, they can change the message. The direction of travel here is digital ads are now accounting for over half of all the ads we see, and that's just going to go up. And of course, there are a lot of people I know who are worried about the potential implications about their data being in the hands of technology companies. But then there are other people who say, so I'm getting shown ads that are targeted to what I'm interested in. We've covered over the course of the show so far that this might mean that we're starting to see less creative and emotionally engaging ads. But what would you say to people who might initially quite like the idea of targeted advertising when they first hear it? You know, what does this mean for our democratic futures mm. when a handful of powerful companies and ultimately political groups are able to gain almost second by second access 
to whatever you do. You know, it's not just what you do online because online is now integrated with our so-called offline experience. For example, when you go into the grocery store, supermarket, and you use a loyalty card, that's also connected to your online profile. They know everything about you. What we've already seen with programmatic advertising is unprecedented manipulation in our political process, from Cambridge Analytica to Brexit to Russian disinformation in the U.S. presidential campaign. The list goes on. Programmatic advertising is playing a role, undermining democracies, hurting consumers, and can do much more because right now there really are, certainly in the United States, no limits to how uh, programmatic advertising can operate. And Jeff, you work for an organization called the CDD, the Center for Digital Democracy. What is that? CDD was basically set up to ensure that the growth of the internet would evolve in ways that would reflect democratic values and the public interest. From the very beginning of the commercial internet era around uh, 1993, 1994, which is when we started our work here in Washington, D.C., we understood that advertising And the data collected for targeted advertising was the DNA of the internet. And that commercial imperatives would shape how the internet evolved. So we started examining it and investigating what was going on with the internet. We're actually responsible for the only US online privacy law there is, which unfortunately just covers children. And it was tough for us to get that through. But we have been investigating how Facebook and Google and Amazon have operated from the very beginning. And we try to sound the alarm and get regulators to look at it. Let's talk about some of the implications of this sort of data harvesting on a grand scale. And we've spoken, I suppose, quite broadly about it. But maybe we can talk more about how a specific demographic of people might have been affected and the CDD's report into big food, big data, and the child obesity crisis. Can you tell me a bit about that? So the food and beverage companies have been in the forefront of online advertising really since the beginning of the commercial internet in the 1990s. And fast food companies are using all their data resources to target young people and other vulnerable groups to buy their products regardless, I said, of the health consequences. So whether it's the cereal box that triggers an interactive game on your mobile phone, or you seeing the brand on billboards as you play the video game, the big food and beverage companies are using the most powerful data tools to target you and children to buy what are basically products that could kill you. We need to have stronger rules limiting how they can collect data and how they can use it. And it's by no means an easy feat. The ads are being tested using the latest techniques to peer into our minds, to figure out how to implant these messages within our kind of emotional brains. And I wish I was making this up because it sounds science fiction. We had someone as part of our show get the test run on them, the facial mapping software. This This is right on topic. Generating advertising based on these predictions about our interests, our likes, our vulnerabilities, and making sure that ads surrounds us wherever we go. So we have to have some rules that regulate how these ads in the 21st century are constructed because increasingly they're, they're personalized. It's an ad that follows us and gets to learn about us in order, frankly, to shape our behavior and reactions. Jeff Chester from the Centre for Digital Democracy with some important reminders of how serious it is that companies are allowed to store and use information about us. Absolutely. And Jeff mentioned to me that he felt that the UK was actually at the forefront of holding big tech to account thanks to measures like the online safety bill. But it's a conversation we need to keep having and keep reviewing given the rapidly changing nature of the digital landscape. Definitely agree. Since researching this topic, I've become fixated by ad breaks, by the way, even the NAF ones. It's one of those where I really want to look away and just can't because I want to know what emotion they're trying to get me to feel or I'm getting a particular promotion for this brand of soap or that kind of deodorant. Maybe big tech trying to tell you something, James. (laughs) Maybe. Sorry in advance to anyone else who I've opened this can of worms for. And we must end it there for this week. Next time, we have one of our panel shows with a phenomenal bunch of brains. The Naked Scientist comes to you from the University of Cambridge's Institute of Continuing Education. It's supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Julia Raley. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.